Faith Tech. Hello, my name is Tony Renke. I am a nonprofit journalist, an author, uh, a teacher, and a podcaster. And I am honored to host the Ask Pastor John podcast with John Piper. And uh, we've been doing that for about a decade now, 1,800 episodes or so recorded now. It's amazing, amazing work. I, I get to live uh, and work in Phoenix, Arizona. This is my home office. Uh, it's a little bit messy, but welcome in. And uh, thank you for the invitation to come and share some thoughts. James asked me if I would share with you in these global meetups um, just a little bit about my new book on technology, God, Technology, and the Christian Life. There it is. That's the new book. Um, and I'm happy to share thoughts on it. We launched this book in January inside of Silicon Valley, which was a dream come true for me. Um, back in the fall of 2019, when I started writing this book, I told my wife, if I can write this big book on technology, this lifelong dream project of mine, um, this book that would take so much time, so much time to research and to write, if I could pull this off, I want to launch it inside of Silicon Valley. And the Lord in his providence um, freed up a lot of time for me in 2020 to write it, uh, namely uh, all my travel got canceled. And so I got to research it, uh, write it, edit it, and publish it. And uh, so now it's out. And some dear friends of ours in San Jose uh, organized a series of events for me from Cupertino in the south to UC Berkeley in the north and uh, events in between. And those friends of ours, along with uh, the generosity of my publisher, Crossway Books, and the generosity of my friends at Desiring God, they all got behind my, my dream. And they said, um, dream big, do something big. And so I did. And so during that week, um, I think we gave away a thousand copies of the book by mail, 400, of, of, uh, 400 copies of the book Inside Silicon Valley we gave away to leaders and to students. And now copies are being shipped to your meetup groups, all free of charge, uh, because we have generous people uh, behind my dreams. And because I have their support, I have zero pressure to sell books, which is awesome. It's such a rare position for an author to be in. Um, to just be able to give books away. So my friends at, and colleagues at Desiring God and our ministry partners, they all say, Tony, dream big. And so I dream big. And I try to write on big topics. I try to do it wisely. I try to do it with an open Bible. Uh, and then we take those books and we blast them out to the world. It's a team effort, um, but the book is done and it's been launched. And... While I was in San Jose, after our formal events had, had ended, it happened to be the three faith tech leaders were in the area. So we met for coffee uh, in Palo Alto one morning. It was one of the absolute highlights of my trip. A wonderful capstone to the Bay Area to meet in person in the flesh. Son, James, and Kevin. And uh, what made it so special was to hear the stories of we, what, what you all are doing to employ your tech gifts to reach the world's most hopeless people in the world. Um, using programming, using design, URLs, SEO, apps, chatbots, using it all uh, to glorify God by meeting needs. You're such a great encouragement to me in fulfilling the vision that I have for the church uh, and using tech to serve those who are in need and suffering. So my job in this season is to help the church understand and appreciate uh, what technologically gifted Christians represent in the mission of the church today. Uh, I'm trying to convince the church not to be afraid of human innovation, uh, afraid of digital tech, but to encourage them. Uh, not to steer young Christians away from tech fields, but instead I'm trying to envision pastors and church leaders and Christian parents to encourage young Christians into major tech platforms uh, to make changes there and to walk out their Christian faith inside Tesla, inside Apple, inside Google, inside Meta, go inside. And, and that is already happening. Here's what I mean. This is one amazing highlight from the Silicon Valley trip. There's so many things to recount, but we had an evening at UC Berkeley of all places. It's not exactly the place that I expected to meet uh, 300 Christians ready to worship out loud. Well, they were there and they were ready. And we worship Christ out loud one evening together uh, in the student center. We opened the windows up wide. Uh, everybody could hear it. And, and these are largely computer science majors um, in this room. And they will soon graduate. And they're going to move south into Silicon Valley. And it was incredible to meet these Bible-believing Christians who love the local church and who are being trained to work inside big tech firms and inside startups and to influence those firms for good. 
So this new book is basically um, the end of a seven year process for me. Back in 2015, uh, I set aside a year for my own heart to get my heart right with the smartphone habits that I'd seen uh, happening inside of my life. I was spending too much time in social media. I was being stupid with my time. I was being foolish with my heart, my affections. Um, I thought social media would fill me. I never did. Instead, it distracted me from what was most important in my life. I used social media all the time for ministry. It was my job. But I also used these platforms selfishly, uh, idolatrously, uh, as idols of security and self-affirmation. Uh, maybe you've been there. Maybe you've experienced that. So for me, I took several digital detoxes in 2015. Uh, time away from social media. Uh, time away from my phone. I deleted apps. I turned my phone off, physically turned my phone off, that sort of thing. And I used that season to confess what I was seeing inside of me. Uh, and I invested more time into prayer, uh, into Bible reading, into meditation on God's truth, more time reading great books, more time with the family, uh, intentional time, planning trips, things like that, and spending more time with them, dreaming about new ministry possibilities. That was something I'd really never done before. I started doing that in 2015. It was a painful season of self-scrutiny. It was a great season of dreaming, but it was also a painful season of, of self-scrutiny, of, of getting inside my heart and asking, what is it that drives me? Um, and it was a fruitful season. And the fruit of it being my 2017 book, 12 Ways Your Phone is Changing You. You've probably heard of this or seen it. 12 Ways Your Phone is Changing You. If you've read it, it's a little painful of a read. <laughs> it was painful to write. I can promise you that. Um, but it was me considering um, what social media was doing to me. And that process led me to consider life inside the attention economy. Uh, how do we as Christians thrive as, as Christians in the digital age of spectacle, the age of the spectacle, in an age when heavily edited eye candy is all around us all the time, every image, every video clamoring for our attention? How do we live by faith in such an I dominant culture? And where do we turn so that our lives are not uh, just inundated with viral, digital, ephemeral, pointless things that don't matter? Um, and that question led me to a second book, a meditation I published in 2019 called Competing Spectacles, Treasuring Christ in the Digital Age. There it is. And this book on spectacles sort of works in tandem with the book on smartphones. They work together. They're really part of the same process uh, as warnings to show biases at work in the world and how our media pushes us towards digital spectacles and hollows out our lives from what is eternally important. But even more importantly, this process again forced me to confront the sinful longings inside of my own heart. That is the root problem. And what I realized after these painful pruning seasons was that my whole take on technology had, had changed. Uh, it had matured. I, I had for a long time been an early adopter of gadgets, a lot of it naively so. Uh, but at the end of the process, I found myself less naive about tech and more aware of its biases. But also at the very same time, I became a lot more aware of God's generosity in the technologies that adorn my everyday life. And that resulted in my meditations on the generosity of God in the science and the medicine and the computers and the cars and the jets of this age, technologies that adorn my life every day. I'm amazed I get to live in this age and not 100 years earlier, not 200 years earlier. And my gratitude for all of my technology culminated in this book, God, Technology and the Christian Life. It's, it's sort of a capstone then. A capstone of this, this seven-year process of going through all of this, seeing my sin exposed, painfully exposed, so that I can see, yes, I was sinning with my smartphone, but now I can see God's glory and his generosity in that same smartphone. And so I wondered, why is this the case? Why did those books um, self-critiquing my own digital media habits lead me here to this place of tech gratitude and tech optimism? And I think it, at one level is the simple fact that we love to externalize our sin. We do. We all do. We desperately want to see evil as something out there, uh, not something in me. Uh, it reminds me of Adam 
who sinned, right? And who pushed off his first sin on the woman that you gave me. That's what he said. I sinned because of the woman that you gave me. In one phrase, he blamed his sin on his wife and on the God who gave him his wife. Think about that. I wouldn't sin if not for this woman. I wouldn't sin had you not put me inside this tempting world, God, with this tree and this wife. Adam said creation was programmed against me from the very start. It's not my fault. It's the programmer's fault. And we continue to echo this very same excuse today. Even Christians, I find, when it comes to technology, prefer to live in the realm of culture critique. Look at the bad things the world does with tech. Look at the propaganda targeting teens on TikTok. Look at how identity politics rips apart Twitter. And we need to be aware of these dynamics for sure. But I fear that Christian critiques of culture are often motivated to absolve us from self-critique. Or so we think. Uh, We love it when our pundits talk about the evil out there in the world, the evil in that party, the evil in those people. Cultural pressures become our scapegoats. Um, If you've seen the the popular documentary, The Social Dilemma, there's some really helpful stuff in there, really worth watching, The Social Dilemma. But the basic takeaway is this. The app made me do it. The app made me do it. It's because of how Facebook is designed that I send on social media or what Twitter celebrates or Instagram or TikTok or Snapchat, whatever. The algorithm made me do it. There are certainly biases and pressures that we feel in culture and in our technology and that exert pressure on us and exploit our inherent sin desires within us, right? We all know it. But at the end of the day, we'd rather blame our sin failures on artificial intelligence or on the world or on the app, or on the algorithm, or on the programmers, all to excuse our own sinful behaviors. So we demonize tech. Because if technology is evil, then the evil is not inside of me. If the evil is out there, out in the the latest gadget from Silicon Valley, and not not, not inside of my heart, then I won't have to face my sin and mortify my heart. See, it's an old trick. It's an old trick. And for this reason, I think demonizing technology is a popular evasion tactic among Christians. Life is just easier if we blame our problems on Silicon Valley and its programmers. But on the other hand, what I found was that once I was willing to confront my own sinful misuse of digital media, not make excuses for it anymore, but to take full responsibility of of this tech age, this tech age opened up to me as a gift. It became a gift, not a scapegoat anymore. Uh, Let me try to put this personal process into a flow chart, if you will. Here's how the process unfolded for me, like cascading levels of discovery. One discovery sort of led to the next one. Uh, It began with one when when I saw tech problems externally. There are tech problems, right? Apps are coded with biases and tendencies we must be aware of. What TikTok celebrates, it wants you to become. So we must never be naive about those idolatrous pressures. The social dilemma is a great start here. We need this awareness, but we don't stop here and say, well, we've addressed technology. Tech is evil. Let's put government controls in place and we're done. It's not that simple because number two, we must address tech problems internally, right? Tech biases work because they push and pull on native sinful inclinations inside of me. Sin is inside of me. And that's what I'm doing in 12 Ways and Competing Spectacles. And this honesty then led to number three, voicing tech gratitude. Um, These internal sin patterns within me, now brought to light, give me eyes to see the generosity and the brilliance of the creator in all the material possibilities that he gave us in his creation. It's stunning when you see it. And then finally, that leads to stage four. Aspiring to technology stewardship. Aware of the biases coded into our tech. Aware of the sin inclinations at work inside of my own heart. Beholding God's generosity in his gifts. Technology can now conform to my calling and inform how I lead and parent tech stewardship. But again, we tend to get stuck at stage one. The algorithm made me do it. And so our parenting, for example, sounds a lot like, no, you can't have that gadget. 
No, you can't have that app. No, you should never do that thing on social media. Never look at that thing online. No, no, no. And it never gets into the heart of sin. Therefore, it never gets into the yes and the amens of tech stewardship, of a vision of life for how how tech can be used to glorify God and to serve others. And that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. So this fourth stage has has huge implications for pastors and parents and for anyone trying to figure out tech ethics. But again, it requires time for these ethics to really get here. We have a lot of work to do. I'm seven years into this process myself, and I suspect for for many other Christians, it's going to, to require years of work to go through a similar process too, especially to arrive at a point uh, in seeing God's goodness and his generosity to us in the technologies that we use and employ every single day day of our lives. So I'm saying we must own our sin in order to see God's generosity in our tech. And this is exactly what the death and the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, makes possible for all of us. We can face our sin honestly because that sin has been canceled by the blood of Jesus Christ. We don't have to run and hide from our sin anymore. We don't blame shift it on others. Adam evaded his own sin by demonizing the gift, his wife, and blaming the programmer, God, and thereby he lost sight of God's generosity that was all around him. I think we do the same by demonizing his gifts, demonizing technologies, and thereby we lose sight of God's material generosity that is all around us all the time. This point is crucial. Only through self-critique can we arrive at tech stewardship. And moving from critique to stewardship is actually the key to all Christian ethics, especially so in the tech age. It's not simply about what's bad to avoid. It's what things add no value to my life's purpose and my calling and my goals. Avoid that. Now, of course, yes, we need limits. Some of us will need to get rid of the smartphone for a season or maybe permanently go back to a flip phone. I know of people who have done that, you know, or at least delete apps, delete social media, throw the Xbox away if you need to. Uh, don't give your teenager a smartphone too soon, if ever. <laughs> we need limits because technologies are potent in awakening the deep, lurid desires within our own hearts. So we need limits. But more importantly, we need eyes to see the true problem the lurid desires that are resident inside of each of us as sinners, not outside of us. It's about working towards tech stewardship. Stewardship is the key. That's never never easy. It's hard to get to tech stewardship. It's hard to get to stewardship in general. For example, um, if I tell you money is inherently dirty and evil, get rid of it, that may motivate you. It may make you feel guilty for having and using money. But if I say to you, your money is powerful and dangerous, especially if your heart idolizes wealth. But money is also a gift to you from God. It's his money on loan to you. And you are a steward of every single penny that he's given you. Then the danger is your love of it, not the money itself. Now, in that definition, you can begin to to get a vision of what it means to be a steward of money. Money is meant to be spent to make God look great. That's what money's for. And it's the same with technology. Why do I have an iPhone or social media accounts or a car in the garage or a TV on my wall or medical advances within five minutes of my house or new computers or air conditioning that I need in, in Phoenix, Arizona in the summer? Why do all sorts of technologies adorn my daily life? What's it for? See, a a godless dystopian worldview has nothing to say about stewardship. And thus, a church that buys into the idea that God is irrelevant to tech will have very little to say about tech stewardship. And that's the church's challenge right now. A God-centered vision of tech as a gift is essential to understanding our stewardship with what we do with our tech. And that's what I learned in these seven years. God makes everything from nothing. We make nothing. From nothing. We are simply playing with the possibilities the Creator gave us in order to show the world how great our God is. That's why we exist. That's why SpaceX exists, and Tesla, and Twitter, and TikTok. 
And this is where you all fit in. You are already stewarding tech. You are writing that book I can't write. You are metaphorically writing the book on tech stewardship by what you're making together right now. We need more of you. We need more Christians thinking deeply about how to steward the available tools we've been given to serve the sick and the hurting and the lost and the helpless in this world. And how to serve Christians as well in local churches. So thank you for your thoughtfulness, your vision. Thank you for encouraging me in the work that you are doing. And thank you for allowing me this time with you today. And now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all.